Well, thank you for that generous introduction. The world always needs heretics to challenge the prevailing orthodoxy. We are lucky that we can be heretics today without being burned at the stake. But unfortunately, I'm an old heretic. Old heretics don't catch much ice. When you hear an old heretic talking, you can always say, too bad, he's lost his marbles, <laughs> and pass on. What the world needs is young heretics. So I'm hoping one or two of you people in the audience might fill that role. That all the fuss about global warming is grossly exaggerated. Here I'm opposing the holy brotherhood of climate model experts and the crowd of deluded citizens who believe the numbers predicted by the climate models. Of course, they say, I have no degree in meteorology and I'm therefore not qualified to speak. But I have studied the climate models and I know what they can do. The, mo the models solve the equations of fluid dynamics and they do a very good job of describing the fluid motions of the atmosphere and the oceans. They do a very poor job of describing the clouds, the dust, the chemistry and the biology of fields and farms and forests. They do not begin to describe the real world that we live in. The real world is muddy and messy and full of things that we don't yet understand. It's much easier for a scientist to sit in an air-conditioned building and run computer models than it is to put on winter clothes and go out and measure what's really happening outside in the swamps and the clouds. That's why the climate model experts end up believing their own models. There's no doubt that parts of the world are getting warmer, but the warming is not global. I'm not saying the warming does not cause problems. Obviously it does. Obviously we should be trying to understand it better. What I'm saying is that the problems are grossly exaggerated. They take away money and attention from other problems that are more urgent and more important, such as poverty and infectious diseases and public education <coughs> and public health, and the preservation of living creatures on land and in the oceans. Not to mention easy problems, such as the timely construction of adequate dikes around the city of New Orleans. I will talk about the global warming problem because it's interesting, even though its importance is exaggerated. To understand the movement of carbon through the atmosphere and biosphere in detail, we need to measure a lot of numbers. I don't want to confuse you with a lot of numbers, so I will ask you to remember just one number. The number that I ask you to remember is one hundredth of an inch per year. That's to say one inch <coughs> per century. So now I'll explain what that number means. Consider the half of the land area of the earth that's not desert or ice cap or city or road or parking lot. This is the half of the land that's covered with soil and supports vegetation of one kind or another. Every year it absorbs and converts into biomass a certain fraction of the carbon dioxide that we emit into the atmosphere. We don't know how big a fraction it absorbs since we have not measured the increase or decrease of the biomass. The number that I ask you to remember is the increase in thickness averaged over one half of the land area of the planet of the biomass that would result if all the carbon that we are emitting by burning fossil fuels were absorbed. The average increase in thickness is one hundredth of an inch per year. The point of this calculation is the very favorable rate of exchange between carbon in the atmosphere and carbon in the soil. To stop the carbon in the atmosphere from increasing, we only need to grow the biomass in the soil by a hundredth of an inch per year. Good topsoil contains about 10% biomass. So a hundredth of an inch of biomass growth means about a tenth of an inch of topsoil. Changes in farming practices, such as no-till farming, avoiding the use of the plow, cause biomass to grow at least as fast as this. If we plant crops without plowing the, plowing the soil, more of the biomass goes into roots which stay in the soil and less returns to the atmosphere. If we use genetic engineering to put more biomass into roots, we can probably achieve much more rapid growth of topsoil. I conclude from this calculation 
that the problem of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a problem of land management, not a problem of meteorology. No computer model of atmosphere and ocean can hope to predict the way we shall manage our land. When I listen to the public debates about climate change, I am impressed by the enormous gaps in our knowledge, the sparseness of our observations, and the superficiality of our theories. Many of the basic processes of planetary ecology are poorly understood. They must be better understood before we can reach an accurate diagnosis of the present condition of the planet. When we're trying to take care of a planet, just as when we're taking care of a human patient, Diseases must be diagnosed before they can be cured. We need to observe and measure what is going on in the biosphere before we can hope to cure it. Everyone agrees that the increasing abundance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has two important consequences. First, a change in the physics of radiation transport in the atmosphere. And second, a change in the biology of plants on the ground and in the ocean. Opinions differ on the relative importance of the physical and biological effects and on whether the effects, either separately or together, are beneficial or harmful. The physical effects are seen in changes of rainfall, cloudiness, wind strength and temperature, which are customarily lumped together in the misleading phrase global warming. In humid, in humid air, the effect of carbon dioxide on radiation transport is unimportant because the transport of radiation is already blocked by the much larger greenhouse effect of water vapor. The effect of carbon dioxide is important where the air is dry, and air is usually dry only when it's cold. Hot desert air may feel dry, but it often contains a lot of water vapor. The warming effect of carbon dioxide is strongest where the air is cold and dry, mainly in the Arctic rather than in the tropics, mainly in winter rather than in summer, and mainly at night rather than, than in daytime. The warming is real, but it is mostly making cold places warmer rather, rather than making hot places hotter. To represent this local warming by a global average is grossly misleading. The fundamental reason why carbon dioxide abundance in the atmosphere is critically <coughs> important to biology is that there is so little of it. A field of corn growing in full sunlight in the middle of the day uses up all the carbon dioxide within a meter of the ground in about five minutes. If the air were not constantly stirred by convection currents and winds, the corn would stop growing. About a tenth of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is converted into biomass every summer and given back to the atmosphere every fall. That is why the effects of fossil fuel burning cannot be separated from the effects of plant growth and decay. Greenhouse experiments show that many plants growing in an atmosphere enriched with carbon dioxide react by increasing their root to shoot ratio. This means that the plants put more of their growth into roots and less into stems and leaves. A change in that direction is to be expected because the plants have to maintain a balance between the leaves collecting carbon from the air and the roots collecting minerals from the soil. The enriched atmosphere tilts the balance so that the plants need less leaf area and more root area. Now consider what happens to the roots and shoots when the growing season is over, when the leaves fall and the plants die. The new grown biomass decays and is eaten by fungi or microbes. <coughs> Some of it returns to the atmosphere and some of it is converted into topsoil. On the average, more of the above ground growth will return to the atmosphere and more of the below ground growth will become topsoil. So the plant with increased root to shoot ratio will cause an increased net transfer of carbon from the atmosphere into topsoil. If the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning has caused an increase in the average root to shoot ratio of plants over large areas, the possible effect on the topsoil will not be small. At present, we have no way to measure or even to guess the size of this effect. The aggregate biomass of the topsoil of the planet is not a measurable quantity. But the fact that the topsoil is unmeasurable does not mean it's unimportant. 
At present, we don't know whether the topsoil of the United States is increasing or decreasing. Over the rest of the world, because of large-scale deforestation and erosion, <coughs> the topsoil reservoir is probably decreasing. We don't know whether intelligent man land management could increase the growth of topsoil by 4 billion tons of carbon per year, the amount needed to stop the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. All that we can say for sure is that this is a theoretical possibility and we ought to be seriously exploring it. But beyond the disagreements about facts, there's another disagreement, a deeper disagreement about values. The disagreement about values may be described in an oversimplified way as a disagreement between naturalists and humanists. Naturalists believe that nature knows best. For them, the highest value is to respect the natural order of things. Any gross human disruption of the natural environment is evil. Excessive, excessive burning of fossil fuels is evil. Changing nature's desert, either the Sahara Desert or the Ocean Desert, into a managed ecosystem where giraffes or tuna fish may flourish is likewise evil. Nature knows best, and anything we do to improve upon nature will only bring trouble. That naturalist ethic is, I believe, the driving force behind the Kyoto Protocol. The humanist ethic begins with the belief that humans are an essential part of nature. Through human minds, the biosphere has acquired the capacity to steer its own evolution, and we are now in charge. Humans have the right and the duty to reconstruct nature so that humans and biosphere can both survive and prosper. For humanists, the highest value is harmonious coexistence between humans and nature. The greatest evils are poverty, underdevelopment, unemployment, disease and hunger, all the conditions that deprive people of opportunities and limit their freedoms. The humanist ethic accepts an increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a small price to pay if worldwide industrial development can alleviate the miseries of the poorer half of humanity. The humanist ethic accepts our responsibility to guide the evolution of the planet. The sharpest conflict between naturalist and humanist ethics arises in the regulation of genetic engineering. The naturalist ethic condemns genetically modified food crops and all other genetic engineering projects that might upset the natural ecology. The humanist ethic looks forward to a time not far distant when genetically engineered food crops and energy crops will bring wealth to poor people in tropical countries and incidentally give us tools to control the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Here I must conclude by confessing my own bias. <laughs> Since I was, brought, I was born and brought up in England, I spent my formative years in a country with great beauty and a rich ecology which is almost entirely man-made. The natural ecology of England was uninterrupted and rather boring forest. Humans replaced the forest with an artificial landscape of grassland and moorland, fields and farms, with a much richer variety of plant and animal species. Quite recently, only about a thousand years ago, we introduced rabbits, a non-native species which had a profound effect on the ecology. Rabbits open glades in the forest where flowering plants now flourish. There is no wilderness in England, and yet there is plenty of room for wildflowers and birds and butterflies, as well as a high density of humans. Perhaps that's why I'm a humanist. <laughs>